Chapter 5, the integumentary system. The integumentary system consists of two main parts with some parts integrated into those main two parts. So if you'll look at the board, I'll demonstrate for you the main two parts. We'll label them and then we'll get into a little bit more detail. So the skin is made up of two main layers. We have the cutaneous membrane. and the subcutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is made up of two layers. Top layer is the epidermis. The middle layer is the dermis. And the bottom layer, the subcutaneous membrane, is also known as the hypodermis. So this top part, the cutaneous membrane made up of the epidermis and dermis, is the main bulk of the skin. And then the underlying layer, subcutaneous membrane, is mainly fat. And we'll take a look at that a little bit closer in a little while. Now, in these layers, we have some accessory structures. And this would include things like glands, nails, and hair. And we've also got, again, this subcutaneous membrane, which is also known as the hypodermis, that's going to act as a great insulator for us. Um, as we go a little further, we'll look closer at the subcutaneous membrane, but we're going to start out by first talking about the functions of the skin in general. So the integumentary system functions in, first of all, protection. So the main reason we have skin is to protect us from the external environment. Uh, things like bacteria, viruses, ultraviolet light, dehydration. The skin is our best protector when it is completely intact. We're most susceptible to problems when our skin has a break in it, which will allow bacteria, to get down into the skin and possibly cause an infection. So the best barrier that our skin can, can be is an intact barrier. Excretion, we're gonna excrete salt, water, and organic waste out of our glands. And we'll get into the glands a little bit further on. And temperature maintenance, our skin helps us maintain temperature in two main ways. The first way is by sweating, whenever we get overheated, the sweat glands will produce a watery sweat, and that watery sweat will then evaporate, pulling heat from the surface of our body, which cools us off. Our skin also insulates us with our hypodermis. And again, the hypodermis is a storage area for fat. And unfortunately, sometimes we can store a little bit extra in our hypodermis, which makes us look thicker because we store fat or lipids within that third skin layer. But that fat also helps us to keep warm and gives us a little bit of insulation and padding. Nutrient storage, we mainly store lipids uh, in our skin in that hypodermis. And so when we lose weight and we shrink down those lipids, it makes us look thinner because our hypodermis is thinner. Vitamin D3 synthesis, we're also going to save this for a little bit later when we get to talking about the sun's involvement with our skin. And finally, sensory detection. We're able to pick up on our environment through our skin. We can feel if the wind blows, we can feel if it's cold or warm outside, or if a bug lands on our arm. We feel and interpret stimuli from our environment through our skin. So this is a picture of the three main sections of skin. Um, starting again at the top, we have the epidermis, which is the thinnest of the three layers. 
very thin in comparison to the dermis and the hypodermis. So the epidermis is what you would actually touch if you touch the surface of your skin. The middle section, the dermis, which is quite thick, is very elastic and stretchy and has a lot of fibers in it that are going to give it a lot of resistance. Inside the dermis, we can also see some main structures. It's a very busy layer. We have glands. Here's a gland here. Lots and lots of blood vessels, hair, and we have sensory nerves. Okay. So as we move through here, we can see things are a lot more busy than they appear to be in the epidermis. The deeper we go in the subcutaneous layer or hypodermis, we have a thick layer of adipose tissue. And again, when we gain weight, this is where we store the extra adipose tissue, which makes our skin look thicker. In the subcutaneous layer, not only do we have lots of fat, but we also have large blood vessels. This is why when we cut ourselves, the deeper we cut ourselves, the more we bleed. If you notice here, the blood vessels are a lot smaller, and in the epidermis, there are no blood vessels. So if we cut ourselves very lightly, we might not bleed too much, but if we cut ourselves very deep and cut into the arteries and veins here, then we can see quite a bit more blood. So the deeper we go, the more vascular we become. So we're going to start first with the epidermis, which is our top protective layer. And the epidermis is composed of layers of keratinocytes. Now anything that ends with the word site means cell. So a cardiocyte would be a heart cell, a hepatocyte would be a liver cell, a keratinocyte is a skin cell. And the reason it's called a keratinocyte is because these skin cells are filled with a waterproof protein, keratin. Keratin is the first part of this word here if you need the spelling. Keratin, a waterproofing protein. So whenever we take a shower, we've probably noticed before that when you take a shower, you don't absorb all of the water that falls on your skin or we'd be like giant water balloons every time we got out of the shower. The water actually runs off the surface of our bodies and beads up on our skin because our skin is waterproof thanks to the waterproofing protein keratin. So each skin cell is filled with this keratin and our skin, the epidermis, can either be thin or thick, classified as thin or thick. Thin skin has what's called four layers of strata and thick skin has what's called five layers of strata. And in just a second, I'm going to demonstrate for you what the strata look like. Thin skin is about 0.08 millimeters thick. 0.08 millimeters thick. That's pretty small. Thick skin is about 0.5 or half of a millimeter thick. Now, when we think of thick skin, we might expect it to be really, really thick, and hearing half of a millimeter does not sound like it's very thick. But if you think about it, it actually is quite thick because we have microscopic cells stacked up on top of each other. So how many microscopic cells do you think would have to be stacked on top of each other to equal half of a millimeter, which is visible to the human eye without a microscope? So in order for us to see the thickness of half of a millimeter, that would have to be a lot of cells stacked up on top of each other. So even though half a millimeter doesn't sound like much, it's quite a lot of cells and actually very protective. And again, in a minute, we'll look at a cross section and see how many cell layers are actually in there. Now, before we look at the individual strata, I want to point out this picture down here on the left. This is a picture of the epidermis and the dermis. And in this picture we can see the epidermis has been pulled back a little bit. And when we pull it back we can see that the bottom part of the epidermis has these wavy ridges in it. Those wavy ridges are called the epidermal ridges. And if you notice the dermis has corresponding wavy ridges as well and that's called the dermal papilla. Now, a way you can always remember what the, word, what the word papilla means is papilla actually means nipple-shaped. So that's where we get that from. So we have epidermal ridges and we have dermal papilla. So the epidermal ridges 
fit into the dermal papilla like puzzle pieces or a lock and key. You can see that they look like they're opposite patterns. They fit together perfectly. Now one more thing to mention about the epidermis is that the epidermis is what's called avascular. Avascular as in no direct blood supply. So if you look at this picture here and you focus on the epidermis, there is no blood vessels. No blood vessels in the epidermis at all, which seems strange when we think of a tissue and we think of it not having blood vessels, it doesn't seem to make much sense. But if you remember what we talked about in chapter four, the epidermis is made up of epithelial tissue, which lines or covers surfaces of the outside of the body or the inside of the body. And we mentioned then that it was avascular. And since the epidermis is made up of epithelial tissue, it also has no direct blood supply. But this makes a lot of sense because think about if the very top surface of your skin was very vascular, then even bumping into something as soft as a pillow or a feather could potentially cause you to bleed to death. The epidermis is not going to be very protective to you if it bleeds very easily because then we would lose blood over the smallest things. So in order for the epidermis to be very tough and protect you from the outside environment, it doesn't need to bleed easily, which is why it does not have blood vessels in it. So it's going to receive all nutrients through diffusion from the underlying dermis. So the dermis will actually pass nutrients and oxygen into the epidermis to keep it happy and full of oxygen and nutrients. So the epidermis itself, its main function is to provide mechanical protection from your environment. So we can bump into things without our skin tearing and it protects the underlying tissues and organs. It also keeps us from losing too much fluid. It holds in our moisture and keeps microorganisms like bacteria from invading the body. Now if you'll look back over at the board again, we'll draw the layers of the epidermis. All right, so within the epidermis, we have five layers of strata. Starting at the very bottom layer, and you're gonna notice, or you should notice in your notes right now that you printed from the website, you should have the layers of the epidermis spelled out for you on your notes. So because of my limited space, I'm going to use abbreviations but the correct spellings, the full words, are on your outlines right now that should be in front of you as you're taking these notes. So the bottom layer of strata is the stratum germinativum. The stratum germinativum. Now whenever you see the word or any word that has germ in it, you should not think of bacteria, you should think of reproductive. The stratum germinativum, these are germinative cells cells that are constantly going through mitosis, dividing, dividing, dividing. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because we are losing excessive amounts of skin every single day. If you stand in front of a window and you rub your arm, as the sunlight's coming in, you rub your arm pretty hard, you can see little flakes of skin floating off from the surface. These are dead flaky skin cells and they're always shedding off. We're leaving them behind everywhere we go. A large percentage of household dust is made up of skin cells. So actually the more people you have living in a house, the more dust you'll collect because the more skin cells are floating around. And add animals to the mix and that increases it even more. So as quickly as we're shedding off skin cells, we need to be replacing them as fast as we're shedding them off or we would run out of the epidermis. So the stratum germinativum is the dividing layer. So I'm going to draw a little cell here and show that cell dividing. Okay, so it's constantly going through mitosis, making new skin to replace the skin that we lose. The next layer up is called the stratum spinosum. 
The stratum spinosum contains the daughter cells, the cells that were just produced by the germinativum. So it includes the brand new daughter cells. The next layer up is the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum, in this layer, the cells have stopped dividing, stopped dividing, begin making keratin, remember that's the waterproofing protein, begin making keratin, and also begin to dehydrate. Okay, so the cells are starting to dehydrate and beginning to become waterproof. Next up, we have the stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum, this layer has flat, densely packed, completely keratinized cells. Flat, densely packed, completely keratinized cells. And then the top layer, what you would touch if you touch the surface of your skin right now is the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum contains about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells contains about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells that are connected by desmosomes. This is why they shed off in sheets, like when you get a sunburn. It takes about 15 to 30 days for cells to move from the bottom layer to the top layer. So about every 15 to 30 days, your epidermis is completely new. About every 15 to 30 days. It's dry, so bacteria cannot thrive. Keeps it nice, dry, and scaly, so bacteria can't thrive. So if we go back over to the board, or back over to the PowerPoint, I'm gonna go forward a few slides just to show you these layers, and then we'll backtrack a little bit over what we skipped. So in this picture, this is a cross section through the skin, and down here at the bottom, this pink area, this is all dermis, the second layer of the skin, and you can see the dermal papilla, those nipple-shaped bumps in the dermis, and we can see the epidermal ridges, which correspond with the dermal papilla, that fit together like two puzzle pieces. So from here, to here is all epidermis, and this would be the surface of your skin up here, what you would touch if you touch your arm right now. So down here at the bottom, we can see the stratum germinativum, which is the bottom dividing layer, always going through mitosis, making new cells. Next, we have the stratum spinosum, which are the daughter cells, the newly produced cells. Stratum granulosum, these are starting to accumulate keratin and beginning to flatten out just a little bit. We then have the stratum lucidum, which are flat, densely packed, and completely keratinized. And this whole section here, from there to there, all stratum corneum, dead, flaky, dehydrated, and completely keratinized, very protective. So from there, to there is only half of a millimeter thick, not even a whole millimeter from there to there, which didn't sound like a lot when I first told you that your epidermis was only about half of a millimeter thick, but look how many cells are crammed into half of a millimeter. So even though it doesn't sound like much, it is very, very protective. Alright, so going back to where we left off, fingerprints, why do we have them? Well, this picture is, shows the surface of a fingertip, and in this picture we can see ridges and swirls, which look pretty characteristic of a fingertip, or fingerprint. And what this is, is actually a pattern or reflection of your epidermal ridges. The epidermal ridges are much steeper on the fingertip, which causes them to show on the surface of the skin. 
And looking in between these epidermal ridges, we can see all these little openings. Those are pores. Those are openings to the sweat glands. So on the tips of your fingers, you have tons and tons of sweat glands that are constantly producing sweat even when you're not hot. So every time you touch any surface, you're leaving a stamp of sweat in the shape of your epidermal ridges, and that's what we call a fingerprint. And no two fingerprints are the same, which is why it can be used as an identifying characteristic. So again, every time you touch a surface, you're leaving a stamp of sweat in the shape of your epidermal ridges. Now, why do we have them though? Epidermal ridges are for improving our gripping ability. Just like if you were going to climb the side of a mountain, if you buy mountain climbing shoes, you'll notice that shoes that are used for any type of hiking or mountain climbing are very rugged on the bottom. So a rugged sole helps for gripping in activities like hiking. So the same kind of thing applies. Our fingertips have a rugged surface that allow us to hold on to objects better especially smooth objects we can hold on to a lot better because of the rugged fingertips. So eventually in your epidermis, cells will accumulate keratin and shed. Epidermal ridges are interlocked with dermal papilla like puzzle pieces that we talked about before. We have fingerprints which improve our gripping ability and we also have in the epidermis Langerhans cells found in the stratum spinosum and Langerhans cells are for immunity. So if a bacteria does get down into our skin then it can actually protect us from infection because these little cells will engulf bacteria or pathogens. Merkel cells are sensitivity cells in the stratum germativum. They sense light touch, pressure, and pain. So the deeper we get cut, the more sensitivity we have, as we know, the more we get cut, the more it hurts because the deeper we go, the more nerve endings and cells like Merkel cells we have that pick up on pressure and pain. All right, so skin color actually depends on a lot of things. Um, for one, blood supply. If we get embarrassed or nervous and our face flushes with blood, we tend to look a little bit red or rosy. So increased blood supply makes us look pink, red, or rosy, especially when we are light skinned, it's very visible. If we're extremely cold or if we cut off blood supply to a certain part of our body, it begins to turn blue, white, purple, or even potentially black if blood supply is cut off for too long. This is called cyanosis, interrupted blood supply, cyanosis. Now we also have pigments that can determine the color of your skin. The first one is keratin. Be careful you don't get keratin mixed up with keratin. Keratin is a waterproofing protein. Keratin is an orange yellow pigment. Keratin comes from orange yellow vegetables or fruits, things like sweet potatoes or carrots. They're full of keratin, which is also a type of vitamin A. And vitamin A is good for you, but you can get too much of it. Um, if we eat too many carrots, now I don't just mean having a handful of carrots every day or having shredded carrots on a salad here and there, but eating carrots or sweet potatoes excessively, uh, meal after meal after meal after meal, can actually start to turn you orange. Um, keratin begins to collect in the skin and can actually make your hands and feet go orange first and then it can spread. This is something we see in babies quite a lot because a lot of times picky babies even love sweet potatoes and they'll eat, eat, eat sweet potatoes and you'll start noticing their little nose and cheeks kind of take on a little bit of an orange hue. Um, and this is because of the collection of keratin. And of course if you stop eating um, too much keratin, then the skin color will return to normal. So it is not permanent, but we can change our skin tone by eating too much keratin. And next we have melanin, which is a brown-black pigment. 
And even if we're very fair, we all have melanin in our skin, but some of us have more melanin than others or more melanocytes than others, dark skinned people in particular. Melanocytes are very odd looking cells that produce melanin in response to ultraviolet radiation. So I'm gonna show you what a melanocyte looks like and then I'll show you how they work. So in this picture here, we can see the epidermis. So all these are epidermal cells and down below is a melanocyte, which is a melanin producing cell. And it kind of looks a lot like an octopus. It has all these little tentacles coming off of it. Whenever the melanocyte is um, exposed to ultraviolet light, it produces these little brown pigments of melanin, which darken the skin's color. Okay, so now if you'll look at the board, I'll demonstrate to you a little bit more what the melanocytes do. So if this is a skin cell, I'll draw a nucleus inside of it, and then of course we know that the nucleus houses our DNA. So I understand like anyone else why tans are attractive, because if you're pale, if you're Caucasian, then um, we can tend to look kind of white sometimes, and a lot of people associate tan skin with being pretty. And it is, but there is a lot of risk involved in tanning. And one of the main reasons for this is if you are naturally light skinned, whenever ultraviolet light, which is in the sun's rays, penetrates our skin. Now I'm not just talking about laying out in the sun um, or being in the pool or getting in the tanning bed, which all are extreme examples of this. Even just walking to your car after class, or riding in your car where the left side of your body is exposed to the window and ultraviolet light is penetrating through the window. Even short bursts of exposure like that, just walking through a parking lot or walking outside quickly, all count in ultraviolet exposure. When ultraviolet light penetrates the skin, what it does is it actually penetrates right through the nucleus. Now the problem with that is that ultraviolet light is a mutagen. It can actually cause mutations in your DNA, in the skin cells. And if there's a mutation, sometimes those mutations can lead to cancer cells. And what happens, the mutation actually causes the cell to begin dividing out of control. It can form a mass which can spread and choke out other organs and tissues. These are very severe and very, very dangerous types of cancer, especially cancers like melanoma, which can even pop up on the bottom of the feet or the scalp, two places that we don't often check too much. So every time we're outside, we expose ourselves to this ultraviolet light, which increases the risk of cancer. Now, the problem with this, again, is because ultraviolet light causes mutations in the DNA, and then the DNA begins to cause the cell to divide out of control and form a mass. Now, <clears throat> what the cell does in response is, because the cell is being penetrated with ultraviolet light, this will stimulate the melanocytes. Melanocytes will produce little brown pigments called melanin pigments. Those little brown pigments line up in front of the nucleus, just like you see here. And if you've figured it out, it looks like those little melanin molecules are trying to block the nucleus of exposure. Well, that's true. That is exactly what those little melanin pigments are doing. They form a shield or barrier in front of the nucleus, and this causes ultraviolet light to reflect so that it cannot be absorbed by the nucleus. So you might think, oh good, I'll get a tan, and then I'll be protected from the sun. Well, you realize how that doesn't really make any sense. If you are naturally light-skinned, then you are very susceptible to damage because every time your body begins to change color, every time a tan begins to appear on your skin, it's your body's way of telling you that you're being damaged. A tan is a sign of ultraviolet exposure because the body only tans when it's being exposed to ultraviolet radiation.
the brown pigments that line up in front of the nucleus like this, they actually make the skin cells look darker, which is what we call a tan, but it is a sign that the skin is being damaged. So changing color, though it looks pretty, is evidence that we're damaging our body and we are exposed to ultraviolet light. This is why we've noticed actually higher incidences of skin cancer on the left side of the body because of just driving. Just driving gives us enough exposure to potentially produce cancer. Now, does this mean that if you have dark skin, you're completely safe? Well, if you naturally have dark skin, meaning you are African American, Indian, Native American, if you were born with dark skin, you are very well protected from the sun because you already have this melanin arrangement which makes your skin look dark, but it protects you from ultraviolet radiation. Now, does that mean you can't get skin cancer if you're dark skinned? Absolutely not. You can still get, dark, still get skin cancer when you're dark skinned, but the incidence is much lower. We see the highest rates of skin cancer in Caucasian people, European descent, much, much higher rates. And getting in a tanning bed is like 10 times worse than being out in the sun because it is direct ultraviolet exposure. It's much, much, much um, more ultraviolet exposure, which is what leads to quicker tanning by getting in a tanning bed. And be careful because every time you burn yourself enough to peel, you increase the risk of skin cancer later in life because it's considered a second degree burn. Now this also is something that needs to be taken into consideration if you have a baby. It's very important for babies to wear, to wear sunblock every time they go outside for extended periods of time because studies are now showing that just one incidence of a burn on a baby before they have really developed thicker skin um, can actually increase the chance of skin cancer later in life by 50%. So if you have a baby, it's very important to keep them in sunblock as much as you can. Now about sunblock, what does it actually do? Well, there are two types of sun protection creams. We have sunscreen and we have sunblock. Sunscreen is okay, it's not great, um, but sunscreen sounds like what the name implies. Sunscreen just screens out some of the ultraviolet radiation. So you still get some penetration of ultraviolet light, but it's not as much. It filters out some or screens out some of the ultraviolet light. Sunblock is a much better choice. Sunblock does what it sounds like. It actually forms a mirror on the surface of the skin and causes the ultraviolet light to bounce off of the skin completely. So sunblock should, if used properly, completely block you from all types of ultraviolet radiation. Now, when I say used properly, it is very important that when using sunblock, we put it on at least 15 to 30 minutes before we go outside to allow it time to absorb before we begin sweating it off. Especially, again, if you have babies or kids, put the sunblock on about 30 minutes before they go outside to allow them to absorb it. Every time you begin sweating a lot or you get in the pool or get wet um, in any way, you definitely need to reapply the sunscreen or sunblock because it does not last permanently, of course. We have to keep putting it back on. So this goes for, again, even short exposures, which is why dermatologists are telling people more and more to wear some type of sunblock every single day on exposed parts of your body. And girls, this is easier for you because we now have makeup with sunscreen in it. Um, things like bare minerals, which include titanium dioxide, a really good type of sunscreen. It's dry, so it doesn't feel greasy, greasy or creamy. Um, or other little moisturizers that have SPF 15 in them are great to protect your skin on your face, specifically where it's very delicate and they now sell dry sunscreen. It's a powder that you can put on, uh, which is especially good for guys because they don't have to rub on all the creamy stuff and feel greasy all day. And exceptionally good for dark skin people because it does not make you look white. Um, we have dark skin and we rub on a lot of sunscreen. It can make your skin look sort of gray 
or ashy or kind of white in appearance, but if you use this powder, it's actually really great for dark skin because it's, it's invisible and it works really, really well without making you feel greasy. And those you can find on the internet. If you just type in um, dry sunscreen and look for ingredients like titanium dioxide, which are really popular in a lot of the powder foundations. So that being said, um, we're going to move on to the um, PowerPoint for epidermal cells. Alright, so epidermal cells also synthesize vitamin D3 when exposed to ultraviolet light. Now I just told you to be careful of ultraviolet light because it can increase the incidence of cancer, but now I'm going to tell you that you need a little bit, um, which sounds uh, very, very counteractive with what I just told you, but um, dermatologists, many of them are now saying we don't actually have to get vitamin D from ultraviolet light, we can take it with a supplement which is probably definitely a safer way to go. Whenever we're exposed to ultraviolet light, um, our skin actually makes vitamin D3, which converts into calcitrol, converts into calcitrol, which helps us digest um, calcium much, much better. In other words, what I'm saying, or you may have noticed this before, if you ever go and buy milk, you might notice that the milk jug says vitamin D milk on it. Um, vitamin D is not something that's naturally found in milk. It's actually added to the milk um, by the manufacturer. And the idea is we cannot absorb calcium without the presence of vitamin D. So if we don't have any vitamin D, the calcium would not be absorbed by our bodies. We would literally just... Um, get rid of that calcium through waste and urine. So by having vitamin D, it produces a chemical called calcitrol, which helps us absorb calcium in the small intestine. So vitamin D being added to milk helps us to better absorb the calcium, which is why all of our milk jugs say vitamin D milk. Um, now, if you do decide to take a calcium supplement, which is especially important for women over the age of 45, um, calcium supplements, when you buy them, you'll notice that they all have vitamin D included so that you can effectively absorb that calcium. Because now when we expose ourselves to ultraviolet light, it, it, gives us, it gives us a lot more chance of running into skin problems. So it may be a safer bet to get vitamin D through dietary ways, though there's still a lot of argument out there about that. Now epidermal cells respond to growth factor. Um, whenever we damage our epidermis, our epidermis is really great at repairing itself. And the last part of the chapter will discuss how to repair a cut. So we'll kind of get to that in a little bit. All right, so the dermis. The dermis is our second layer down and it has two main sections. It has the papillary layer and the reticular layer. The papillary layer is the top part where the dermal papilla are. It contains blood vessels, lymphatics, sensory nerves, and the reticular layer contains lots of collagen and elastic fibers that resist tension. This is why our skin is so tough. We can pull on it and it bounces right back. Now as we age, that collagen and elastin start to deteriorate, which can make our skin look a little more saggy and wrinkly. Now the danger to this is that um, ultraviolet light can actually increase this quite a bit. Um, ultraviolet light can actually chop up the collagen and elastin fibers prematurely and it increases your chance of looking older quicker. Um, so we know those people who tan, 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 tan and they look like leather purses because their skin is so... Um, it's just so rubbery looking because of all the exposure they've had, which really toughens their skin up and chops up that collagen and elastin and makes it their skin look very old very fast. So that's another bonus of trying to avoid too much sun is that it can actually help us keep our youthful appearance for much, much longer. Stretch marks. Um, stretch marks are caused by excessive stretching of the dermis. And stretch marks are everybody's best friend, right? Especially women. Um, 
Now, stretch marks can plague men too. They're not just for women, but women seem to suffer from them quite a bit more than most men. Um, some of the main parts of main big events in life can bring on stretch marks. Um, one of them is just, just physically developing as a young girl. Um, breast development, hip development, as we continue to get larger, um, quick through puberty, it can stretch the skin before it's ready. So when we excessively stretch the dermis and tear the collagen and elastin fibers, it can leave scarring in the skin, which is what we call stretch marks. Another type, uh, type of time in your life where these are um, have a higher incidence is during pregnancy because this is a time where the body changes so rapidly, especially in the stomach, and can lead to stretch marks early. Um, there's no evidence that any of the creams actually do anything to help. Um, some people just seem to genetically be prone to them more than others. Now stretch marks usually start out kind of red or pink in appearance and over time they'll begin to fade and look more white or silvery, kind of shiny. Um, unfortunately they'll never go away. There is no cure for them as of now. Um, we can do things to make them look a little bit less noticeable like the lasering procedure but they're just they right now we just don't really have any great way to get rid of them and another thing we're going to discuss is this bottom line here um, patterns of collagen and elastic fibers in the dermis form what are called lines of cleavage lines of cleavage are very important to surgeons um, in this picture here we can see the front and front half of a body, okay, front half, there's the face, and this is the back half of the body. Scientists have actually mapped out the lines of collagen and elastin that run through the dermis. Now the idea of this is good surgeons will keep these lines of cleavage in mind when making incisions. Okay, so if you look at the board, I'll show you why this, this is important. Okay, let's say that a surgeon needs to make an incision to remove the appendix. Well, in the appendix area, the lines of cleavage run like this. And again, this is the lines of collagen and elastin in the skin. If the surgeon makes the incision along the lines of cleavage, like so, or with the grain, this will allow the wound to heal much better and be less likely for scarring and infection. Because we're going with the grain, the incision will stay closed better, have a hard, it would be a lot harder for this to open up and get infected. And also because it's with the grain, there's not a lot of tugging and pulling on the wound, so the skin doesn't have to over, overcompensate by forming a big scar. Now if we cut against the lines of cleavage, you can see where once we suture this up, the collagen and elastin is going to pull on the incision, which allows higher chance for it to reopen, get infected, and also will cause the skin to overcompensate for that pulling by making a thicker, rougher looking scar. Now that being said, um, plastic surgeons really take this into consideration because the less scarring the better, of course. But there are some procedures, whether they're emergency procedures um, or open heart surgery or whatever, that there is a way to do the incision that's the best for the patient and it may not always correspond with the lines of cleavage. So there are some exceptions where we can't follow this rule, but this is something that is helpful when reducing scarring during procedures. So if we look back at the PowerPoint again, dermal circulation. Um, this figure here shows you how blood goes from the bottom layer up towards the top layer. So down here in the hypodermis, which we're actually going to talk about next, is the large arteries and veins. Okay, we can see large arteries and veins. This network of blood vessels is called the subcutaneous or cutaneous plexus. Okay, a ple plexus is just a network of blood vessels. Subcutaneous or cutaneous plexus. So we have the artery and the vein, arteries carry oxygenated blood, so nutrient-rich oxygenated blood coming through this red artery, and we have deoxygenated blood going through the vein here. 
So what happens is oxygenated blood comes in through the, the oxygen-rich artery and it diffuses up in these small branched areas of the blood vessel. It diffuses all the way up to the top where the epidermis is. Now remember the epidermis is avascular, no blood vessels. So when the blood vessel gets up to the epidermis, it takes a turn and comes back down again. Now as this oxygen rich blood moves up through these branches, oxygen diffuses into the tissue, making the tissue very happy and nourished. And as the blood vessel approaches the epidermis, it gives oxygen and nutrients to the epidermis. And then once the blood is deoxygenated, it will drain back down into the vein head back to the heart and lungs to be oxygenated and begin the process again by returning through the artery. So the cutaneous plexus arteries are found in the subcutaneous layer, which is why it was labeled subcutaneous plexus in that picture. And also along the dermis, on the dermis, we have more sensory receptors for touch and pressure. The subcutaneous layer is also known as the hypodermis and it is largely fat. It stabilizes the skin's position against underlying tissues and organs. So we're going to talk now about accessory structures that are found in the skin and this includes things like hair, glands, and fingernails. So if you'll look at the board, We're going to draw out the anatomy of a hair. All right, so this is our hair. And this is the skin surface here, okay? So this area is the root. And this area is the shaft. Now, down at the bottom of the hair, the hair originates in a follicle, okay? Now, hair is non-living. A lot of times people think of it as living because it grows. But hair is actually not living at all. This is why it does not hurt when we get haircuts. As the hair grows, all it is, the hair, is just an accumulation of protein, the protein keratin. Now, the cells down here in the follicle, they are living and they are producing protein. And that protein that's produced is squeezed out of the follicle like toothpaste out of a tube, which is why hair has a tube shape. It's just a collection of protein, that's it. The cells down here are living and there are nerves and blood vessels down here, so that's why when we pull a hair out, it hurts. But the hair itself is not living. So down here at the bottom, each hair has its own blood supply, its own plexus. If you think about how many hairs you have on your head, that's a lot of vascularization, a lot of blood supplies, if, a lot of blood supply if every hair on your head has its own hair plexus. This is why if you've ever cut your scalp any time in your life, the scalp bleeds profusely. It bleeds a lot. Um, and that's because every hair has its own plexus. So if we cut the scalp, we're cutting through a lot of blood vessels. Now the hair also has two main parts inside. The hair has a soft core called the cortex, or excuse me, it's called the medulla. And the medulla is made up of soft keratin. The medulla is soft keratin. And the outside portion of the hair is called the cortex, which is made up of hard keratin. Okay, so medulla and cortex, both made up of keratin. 
And then on the surface of the hair, on the surface of all this, we have a real shaggy, rough looking, dead outer coating called the cuticle. This is a lot of times what we see on shampoo commercials when they show a hair under a microscope that looks all jagged and dry like that. And they tell you if you use their product, it's going to change your life. But well, we know this is never really the case. Um, the hair is dead, so it's really impossible to make it healthier per se or repair it because it's not living in the first place. We can use shampoos and conditioners to kind of slick down this cuticle, which makes the hair look a little smoother, but it doesn't actually heal anything because you can't heal something that is dead. So this cuticle that surrounds the outside of the hair is going to protect the outside of the hair. So if you look now at the PowerPoint, you can see some of the definitions that um, for the things that I've drawn out for you. So hair originates in a follicle and is composed of a root and a shaft. The base of the hair is surrounded by a bulb and a root hair plexus. Hair has a soft medulla and a hard cortex. The cuticle is the superficial, dead, protective layer surrounding the outside of the hair. So this picture kind of looks similar to mine, but there's a couple things added to it that I wanted to point out to you. Um, over here we have a muscle that's attached to the hair. That's called the erector pili muscle. And that muscle is what causes the hair to stand on end when you get goosebumps or if you're nervous about something. That little muscle causes the hair to stand on end. Then up here we have a gland. This is the sebaceous gland, which is also an oil gland. And this gland produces oil that will coat the hair shaft. So the reason we have hair is for insulation and protection. Um, hair actually insulates the skull and it guards entrances and exits of the body. So if you think about like your nostrils, there's quite a bit of hair in your nostrils and in your ears. This helps keep large particles from being breathed in every time you take a breath. It also keeps um, bugs and, and dust and pollen from getting too deep down into your system because the hair will actually catch it to prevent that from happening. There are a few different types of hair. We have the first type, which is called vellus hair. Vellus hair is the peach fuzz hair. This is what's found on, on the majority of the body in girls. This is the peach fuzz on your face, on your back, on your stomach, on your chest, on your legs, um, in certain areas. And then terminal hair is heavy hair. This is coarse hair, like what's found on your head, eyebrows, eyelashes, nose hair, coarse, heavy hair. And then we have club hair. Club hair is when a follicle becomes inactive, when the follicle does not produce hair anymore. So hair sheds and grows according to a hair growth cycle. So we're constantly losing hair and many instances growing it right back. Glands in the skin, we have four main types of glands. We have sebaceous glands, which are oil glands, and these are holocrine in nature. Oil glands, which are holocrine. Sudoriferous glands, which are sweat glands, and they can be either apocrine or merocrine. Mammary glands, which produce milk, those are apocrine. And ceruminous glands, which are earwax glands. So we'll start with the oil glands. Sebaceous glands or oil glands discharge a waxy sebum, which is oil, onto a hair when they are associated with a hair and onto the skin when they're associated with skin. So in this picture here, we can see two different types of oil glands. We have an oil gland here in the skin. This one is not associated with a hair. So when it produces oil, it will put the oil directly onto the skin's surface. This is the oil we try to get off of our face when we wash our face. Um, it also um, collects in the hair when we look at the one associated with hair. But oil actually moisturizes and protects the surface of the skin. 
we have another oil gland that can be attached to a hair and it will produce oil and coat the hair. So this is the oil that we get in our hair on our head. Um, and what it does is it coats the shaft of the hair and makes it less likely to break off. So having a little oil in your hair is actually very healthy to prevent breakage. Sudoriferous glands are sweat glands and there's two kinds of sweat on the body. We have smelly sweat and non-smelly sweat. Um, apocrine sweat glands produce an odorous secretion. Apocrine sweat is like armpit sweat. Um, this is the sweat that comes out of sweat glands that are associated with a hair. So in the armpit where hair grows, those hairs have sweat glands attached to them. And because these are apocrine, this is not the most attractive thing you've probably heard about yourself, but these glands if you remember, apocrine glands produce cytoplasm with the secretion. So the sweat in your armpit has cytoplasm in it. And the bacteria that live on your skin in the armpit like to eat cytoplasm. So they feed on the cytoplasm and then they produce gas. And that gas is what we call body odor. So when you smell body odor, you are smelling your bacterial gas at that time. Again, not very attractive but apocrine sweat has cytoplasm, bacteria like to eat it, and they produce gas, which is what we know as body odor. Merocrine sweat glands, these are sweat glands that are not associated with a hair. These are glands that release sweat right onto the skin, like the sweat that's on your face, hands, arms, legs. This sweat is largely water and has no smell to it whatsoever. This is called sensible perspiration. So in the middle we have a sweat gland associated with a hair. This is light in the armpit. And over here we have a sweat gland not associated with a hair that just puts sweat onto the surface of the skin. Mammary glands are similar to apocrine sweat glands and they produce milk. Ceruminous glands are in your ear and produce a waxy cerumen. So cerumen is just a fancy word for earwax. And earwax is actually good. We don't want too much of it, but it coats the inside of the ear, helping to make it waterproof so that water can roll out of it. And also insects and bacteria do not love earwax. So if there's a little coating of it in there, it helps to keep the ear from getting infected and also keeps bugs, little gnats and things from getting in. Nails. Nail body, the nail body covers the nail bed and nail production occurs at the root of the nail. And we have two terms we're going to look at here as well. So the nail is very important because it protects the fingertips. And we also should hopefully know that the nails are not living either. So that's why we can clip them and it does not hurt. Um, so nails are actually made up of the protein keratin, just like the hair. Um, and the nail itself is not living, but the tissue under it is living. And there's so much sensory nerves in the fingertips because it's where we feel that it hurts a ton if a nail gets clipped too short or if it gets pulled back, it's very sensitive. But it is not the nail itself, it's all the, the nerves underneath the nail. So in this picture, there's a cross section through the finger. We can see the bone right here. And there's the nail root. This is where the keratin that makes the nail is produced and pushed out and it covers the nail bed. And then we have this area right here that we call the cuticle, but the correct term for cuticle is epinichium. Okay, so epinichium is the anatomical term for cuticle. The cuticle protects the root of the nail. And then up here we have a little piece of skin that holds the nail down to the fingertip and that's called the hyponychium. Okay, little piece of skin that holds the free edge of the nail down, hyponychium. In this area here, it looks like a little crescent moon on your finger. Some people you can see it better than others. This is called the lunula which that word comes from Luna, which means moon, because it looks like a moon. 
The lanula is an area of your nail where circulation is not as great. So it looks a little bit lighter than the rest of your nail, the lanula. Okay, so what happens when we get a cut? When we get a cut, our skin actually regenerates really well. Um, and it does this by a process of injury and repair um, by forming a scab, then granulation tissue, and finally a scar tissue. So we'll take a look at the steps. Starting on the left, we have a cut in the skin. This is pretty bad because it's going all the way down to the hypodermal surface. And we can see that the skin's been sliced and the blood vessels have been cut, so they begin to bleed. The blood will fill up the cut and then spill out onto the skin's surface. Now the first goal of this process is to form a scab because the number one thing is to prevent blood loss. So in step two, we can see after several hours, a scab has formed, okay? Scab has formed. Now along the way, we have some phagocytic cells that are in the area cleaning up bacteria and trying to keep us from getting infected. The cells of the stratum germinativum, those cells going through mitosis, they're going to divide and migrate along the perimeter of the cut. You can see them coming alongside the scab here. The stratum germinativum gets underneath the cut and then begins to divide, 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 healing from the inside out. Okay, so you can see where the stratum germinativum has been healing, pushing up on the scab from the inside out. And it will continue to do this, pushing up on the scab until the scab pops off. And we're left with some scar tissue below the cut and a little indentation where the scab used to be. But depending on how bad this is, this area will continue to remodel and will look a lot less like a scar or the scar will fade to where it's not very noticeable. Now, of course, if you've cut yourself terribly, you may always have a little reminder of that cut because of the scar that will stay. But again, bleeding, scab, the cells of the stratum germinativum go along the cut, get under the cut, and then begin dividing, pushing up on the cut from the inside out. Until eventually the scab pops off and we're left with a shallow depression where the scab used to be and scar tissue underneath, which, which will continue to be remodeled until the scar tissue is not as noticeable. So when we age, what are the concerns with our skin? Well, one thing, the integument or skin will thin naturally with age. Blood flow decreases to the skin, which means that repairs will occur more slowly because of the decrease in blood flow. So elderly people can still heal, but it takes them much longer to heal than it does a young person. And that concludes chapter five.